Yeah, yeah. Isn't that nice? Well, um, I, you know, I, I think there's a lot. I think there's a lot that we can do uh, to reclaim materials. And I, I totally hear you on the price of gold uh, and the price of any commodity. And you know, one one thing, just in, the, I, in fact, to bring it right straight back to to the topic right now. Um, just on the cover of Time Magazine today was a um, picture of some of the, the fusion energy technologies that are going on. Um, a couple weeks ago I showed you a, a, a diagram of a technology more or less where you have a, a waste stream uh, flowing in, you have some thermal source, heavy things go down, uh, lighter things go up. There are a lot of plasma technologies that are, are working on reducing waste in exactly that same way. So um, uh, once you reach plasma temperatures, you really no longer have the materials, the, the, uh, the compounds that we have. I mean, there, there's just free protons, free electrons flying around, and depending on how that matter then cools, you then end up with uh, different elements. So, um, and to, to, to get, um, yeah, it's uh, well. I, um, I don't know if there's plasma in the mantle of the Earth per se. I don't think it's quite that quite that hot. But it, in the mantle, certainly you have you have more dense elements sinking towards um, well, you know, sinking towards the middle to some degree. But on the other hand, when, once you get right down there at the middle, there's really no gravity anymore. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's kind of, it's a little bit of a little bit of an irony. There's no there's no more gravity at the center of the Earth pulling more matter towards it. So um, a lot of the, a lot of the forces that um, determine where all the matter in the in the uh, center of the Earth are, are driven by convection, thermal gradients, a little bit of uh, chemistry. But uh, when, once you're um, once you're deeper and denser, I think uh, the actual the actual um, density of individual atoms plays less of a role. But I, I do want to look at um, plasma as a hazmat treatment, because what, what we see with, um, with the plasma for, for energy technology currently is that you're putting more energy in than you're getting out. And that's not the way to run any energy technology. It's certainly not the way to run a business either, where you're putting more money in than you're getting out. We even had that same conversation. So if you're over there at the Fume Hood, for example, at Montac, and you know having to pay $1,300 of rent a month, but only getting a few hundred dollars worth of, of materials out, it's not worth your time. So that that's going to be the conundrum conundrum in any situation. How do you get more out than you got in? And I know I've I know I've said this before, but um, and, and I think I covered Shramsky a little bit. Um, I'm, I'm just going to cover it very. I'm going to cover Shramsky very briefly again because I, I think it's uh, fundamental to where we are as a as a global civilization. And then I'll I'll dive back into um, uh, plasma for waste treatment. show you this. And this, and this is going to be critical, especially when we talk about the Solar Forge next week, because as we, as we mentioned already, any one of these recycling technologies, you got to put some energy in. And, and, and we talked a lot about the different types of energy on Tuesday that might go in, electrical, chemical, thermal, et cetera, et cetera. The, event, the question is, are these energies coming from renewable sources or not? Or are they coming from these ancient, irreversible, depletable sources? So just remind me, because I've, I've got um, my, my core group of students in the, in the classroom right now, and I'm just going to ask you to remind me whether or not we've um, touched on this. Because from what, what I've seen, these authors at um, University of Georgia really hit the nail on the head. Do we do we cover this at all yet in um, recycling? I know I've covered it in, in um, 
101 and 102. Are you, is this ringing a bell, Brian? Was that a video? Was there a video? No, there was, there was no, there was no video here. This was, this was the main picture though. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. So the, the, the point here, and we'll talk about it with the solar forge next time, you want to have energy coming in that is, you know, from the sun, all of this cathode energy, as they call it, it's hundreds of millions of years old, and it's not, it's not coming back. So that's really where I wanted to go with that in terms of sustainability. Now, in terms of sustaining a fusion reaction, and we are going to do a little bit of research into, um, let's just do a fusion. Just try. Uh, let's just try waste here. Okay. That was Shramsky. Yeah, I just I just showed Shramsky there very briefly because th this is a this is a paper that really anybody interested in sustainability should be reading right now. Okay. Well, I'll go back and give it another look because it's in the Moodle show, right? This is in Moodle. I'm not sure yeah. if I, I'm not sure if I put Shramsky in the show or not. I I did. I talked about it a lot in, in my Billings talk. I talked about it on the 12th. Okay, thanks. I, I thought we had. And, and again, it's not, it's not central to recycling technology, but it really is an overarching theme for renewable energy and sustainability. Okay, so that's not too bad. We got 1,100 hits when I typed in waste and fusion. Fly ash is, a, is, a, um, is what's coming out of coal-fired power plants. It's a fantastic building material. I've, seen, I've looked at some of the most, uh, you know, claiming to be sustainable uh, buildings, so it's a, it's a great binder. There's some great chemistry going on there for, for building. Right, right. So, again, and, and another key thing to take away, I, I think if you don't, learn anything else from this recycling technology is that um, recycling is in a lot of ways just waste resource management. Um, the tough thing is, is like how, how does the money flow because the, the coal-fired power plant is this giant pile of ash. They don't have so to. One of them they, is active, the other is passive. What, what's that? Active? Waste management is either an active system oh. where you're recycling or it's a passive system where you're yeah. dumping it into a landfill. I like that. Yeah, so just dumping ash into a landfill or some you know, would be would be passive mm -hmm. versus putting it into a building would be active. Into it and to I like that. Okay. I like that. Yep. Okay. So let's just take a look at a, a few of these other ones. Um, progresses and challenges of handling fusion radioactive materials. So radioactive materials, perfect example of a hazmat. What's your comment? Oh, okay. Yeah. Did you see the photos from the basement of Chernobyl? They've got some photos from, the, I guess, the core oh. who's down into the basement of Chernobyl and it's just sitting there. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I guess what I was going to say is, I mean, obviously, economics is, is what we've been sort of building to our whatever. Mm -hmm. How does, like, non or not for profit organizations fit in? Oh. Is it feasible to go that route? I know there's some companies that kind of do that. But. Yeah, that, that's another good question. So the question is how, how would a nonprofit fit into um, a waste reclamation model? Well, again, um, in, any of these, in any of these processes, you have to put energy in from somewhere, and you also have to put money in somewhere. So even a nonprofit the owner operator needs money to sustain his or ho her own livelihood so um, even though the material transport or, or well even though the material transfer might not involve any financial transaction like hey i'm going to take it for free and i'm going to give it to somebody else for free the, you're you're basically the waste broker if you will and the broker needs to get paid some somehow somewhere Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, so it does take some human energy also and 
human energy input also. Yeah, they all and they all take human energy input, absolutely. Um, so let's yeah, just Let's just um, let's just grab one of these. Well, the you know what what humans have going for us is we have fantastic computers. Uh, we do a, a fantastic job of computing with just a few watts of energy. Uh, we're very creative when it comes to finding ways of doing things easier. Uh, so a lot of this has to do with um, radioactive waste. Um, and, a, and a lot of it's also uh, chemical. I had some colleagues there. In fact, one of the same scientists who did investigate the Chernobyl accident is doing a new field called plasma medicine. Let's, let's, let's take a look at this guy really quick. Thermal characteristics and kinetics of refining and chemicals wastewater, lignite, and their blends during combustion. Um, this is coming out of, of, of China. Uh, sometimes the, the, language, um, the language can be a little bit challenging. But let's, let's see if they've got some um, sintering infusion degree. Okay. Um, so let's just, let's just read through this abstract. There's a lot of um, uh, technical jargon, but let's see if we can't just take a look at it because it looks like any process that's that's interested in sustainability has to manage the material waste stream in some ways. So let's just see what these guys are up to. Um, Co-combustion characteristics of refining and, and and again we've already got a, a language issue in the very first sentence unfortunately. Uh, Co-combustion char characteristics of refining and I think they mean um, chemical-laden wastewater solid management, and hyaline lignite, so that's a, uh, a coal, were studied through thermogravimetric analysis. Very similar to what I was just, what I showed before. You've got heat and you've got gravity. So as the, as the heat come in, comes in, the different elements um, separate, right? So, and then the heavy stuff goes down, lighter stuff goes up. Even in my own fireplace at home, I'll stick a you know a, a board in there. The nails don't go up the flue; the nails come out the, the bottom, the, the clinkers, if you will. So that's all that means. Thermogravimetric, and we've already talked about it. Believe it or not, they just stuck it you know and packaged it into one word. Uh, the combustion behaviors of the blends at various RS and. Um, I don't know what RS stands for. It might just be refining solids. That's that's what I'm going to go for. Various uh, refining solids to HL, hyaline lignite ratios, were compared with those of the individual samples. Co-combustion experience showed that the combustion performance of the blends could be improved with the percentage of RS rising. So that just means put in more um, chemicals, wastewater, etc. The reactions between the RS and the HL during the co-combustion could be divided into four phases. Um, no interactions below 120 C. So it, and it's the same thing. It's the same thing you see in your fireplace. If you've got a bunch of wood and paper sitting in there and a bunch of 50 degree air in the living room, it's not going to combust. You, you add that little bit of heat to it with your lighter once you hit a certain critical temperature, then the reaction takes off. So what they're, what they're talking about, at, di at higher and higher temperatures, different reactions take place. We've been doing that, in fact, down uh, with some colleagues in the Bitterroot who are working on a, a value-added process for almond shells coming out of California. So almond, uh, California's got an issue. They've got a lot of almond shells, and they do not have uh, proper infrastructure, technologies, emission laws, et cetera, to deal with it. Um, Montana's uh, not a bad place to get some of that done, so we're doing some of the uh, research for them right here. So extracting some of the oils, not unlike what um, Blue Marble does with waste materials either. Waste, waste biological materials, that is. Okay, so no interactions below 120 degrees C. 
So I think they just, they're just calling that phase one, pH one. And beyond 700 degrees C, that's what they're calling uh, phase four. So they're operating, 120 is the, the bottom, 700 is the top. Uh, inhibitive effects at the temperature range of 120 to 70, so they're just calling that, that overall range of 580 degrees phases two and three. They haven't distinguished between what, you know, what the boundary is. Uh, the results of SEM, and uh, that's uh, scanning electron microscopy, and XRD, that's X-ray diffraction. So scanning electron microscopy allows you to actually see the, the waste particles coming out, and X-ray uh, diffractometry allows you to see what individual elements are in there. You, you fire an X-ray at it and says, okay, these are the chemicals that are left over. Indicated that the sintering and fusion degree of residues, so this, these are things um, combining into solid, after combustion became more severe with the percentage of RS increasing, the isoconversional methods, Kissinger, Arakawa, Sunus, and Flynn, Wall, Oswala were used for the kinetic analysis of the combustion process. And so these are, these are going to be um, standard combustion models. And you know, when, you, when you look at that, you can say, oh, like a, a Newtonian model versus a Einstein model of, of physics. So we can dig into that a little bit more. Were used for the kinetic analysis of the combustion process. The results showed that the activation energy of the refining solids was higher than that of the lignite, and the maximum value was obtained um, at a ratio of 75% lignite to 25% refining solids. Um, yeah, so let's just let's just take a look and see what some of the results are. I, I think if we actually find the paper. So I, I encourage you to do this in your own um, in your own research. Put you know put some citations. Uh, put some citations into your own research paper. We'll go for the full text. this live um, and so the, let's see, I'm not let's, let's just see if we can actually get the let's see if we can get to the full text okay and it's it's a different game every time um, looks like Google Scholar is starting to penetrate Web of Science a little bit more. I was just a little surprised that we kicked all the way out to Google Scholar. Some uh, some publishers will not put their uh, publications out there free. I've had a few publications lately where if you're willing to pay the publisher up front, they will put it out there for free and sort of take their money up front. You know, with the with the um, author paying for the, their own fees. If, if an author is, does not have the financial resource to do that, then they rely on uh, subscribers to pay for the download fees. And you can sort of see how both, both models like might work. If, if, if they don't put it out for free and you have to pay for it and people don't have money to pay for it, then they don't get as many citations for their journal, which is what every journal wants. Every journal wants to be more highly cited than the other one. So it's kind of a double-edged sword there. And again, it comes down to money. <laughs> yeah, so I'm going to save this guy. And, and here's how I suggest you save your papers. So you noticed earlier, I was able to find Shramsky pretty easily because I knew I, it was, I knew it was something that I downloaded relatively recently, and it's also, I think, critical that when you're when you're saving a paper or reading a paper, that you remember the first author's last name. 
because it allows you to communicate more effectively in scientific circles. You're like, oh, I read this paper once by, well, somebody said it. Well, whose was it? Just re remember the first author's last name. Oh, yeah, I remember Smith, 1990. You, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll start to um, build your, so, uh, uh, Chen, <laughs> uh, you know, unfortunately, a lot of times the, the Chinese names there are, are not a huge, huge diversity. But um, you, you could see this. So it was it was Chen et al. Uh, 2015. So I've got a single, and I keep all of my downloads in the same same directory. And so it's Chen, 2015. These these things do start to, to build up. None of none of the rest of that. Oh, 21. Wow, really booking on into the future. There are <laughs> these guys are advanced. Um, and I'll, I'll <laughs> so, and I don't. I really don't know, have much of an idea about what waste management looks like in China. Um, I. I tend to think that um, you know, in some ways they might be a little more creative than we are. In fact, when we bought the um, differential for our Shell Eco Marathon car, it came in a box. I don't read Chinese, but Professor Chen said he read the box and it said uh, black mushrooms on it. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it looks like somebody repurposed a uh, agricultural box and put our technology in it and, and shipped it right over here. So there, there's some resource management for you. Um, okay, so now that you got the paper downloaded, uh, and I'll just, I'll just show you my own strategies for reading through a, a research paper. I've got it downloaded. Uh, there it is right at the top of the list because I sorted by date modified. But I also, if I can, you know, say the word Chen 2015 a couple times, I'll remember, oh yeah, there was the Chen paper on, on waste management. Now we can take a look at it. Yeah, right. Do not, do not remember the ridiculously long titles. We've already read the abs abstract. Let's just read the first paragraph of the introduction. So, wastewater generated from chemical production. I, I just had another student say, gosh, why, don't, why doesn't this go through an English filter first? Well, it actually has. Uh, it's just, it, it, I, the, I've seen worse. But uh, from chemical production, including petroleum refining, is generally characterized by a large amount of highly toxic and poorly biodegradable components. So remember our biosphere, technosphere, you don't want all this water going back into the biosphere because it's going to pollute groundwater, pollute crops, etc. Which is named as refining and chemical wastewater. Okay, so there's our RCW. RCW. In this work, oh, it defined it as RCW in this work. If not properly handled, the wastewater will have some serious and harmful impacts on the ecological environment, especially surface and groundwater sources. The conventional wastewater treatment facilities attempt to utilize a great variety, and here we go, physical, in my mind that's mechanical, when they say you know, a physical process, that I, I read mechanical, chemical, and biochemical. That's something we did not mention on uh, Tuesday, but we have talked a little bit about phytoremediation, if you remember, sort of concentrating these el el uh, elements using nature's nanomachines, so that's what they mean by biochemical method. Something's actually alive and metabolizing this stuff. To reduce the concentration of refractory organics. And again, two strategies, either concentrate it, and a lot of times that's where hazmats try to go, concentrate the heck out of it so you don't have as big of a storage overhead, or um, reduce the concentration so that you can put the stuff back into the biosphere. And there's, there's limits on everything. And you, you know, you, you might shake your head, but I've, I've had some nice conversations 
with uh, Tracy Stone Manning. And I'm not sure if that name rings a bell. Uh, she was my neighbor here in Missoula for a while. Uh, she was working with um, John Tester for quite some time. Uh, then she was tapped by Schweitzer to be the head of the Montana Department of Environmental Quality. Conversation I had with her is a lot of times some of our environmental laws don't make a heck of a lot of sense. For example, arsenic. Arsenic exists in nature. It's uh, you, you wouldn't necessarily go drink it, but there are like, and you wouldn't you wouldn't walk down to Yellowstone right now and take a big swig out of one of the uh, thermal basins, for example, because they have high concentrations of arsenic. So there is arsenic in nature. There are also EPA standards for for the um, effluent of arsenic. So if you're if you have a plant that's dealing with arsenic and some of it gets in the water. Um, and there's no, there's no possible way to get rid of every single atom or molecule. In, in this case, we're talking about atomic arsenic. There were regulations in place where the water ejected from a plant actually had to have less arsenic, a lower arsenic concentration than the, the natural background. So they were, they were putting a, um, a, you know, a policy in place where the plant actually had to be cleaner than nature already was. And so you might scratch your head and say, well, you know, wh why would you do that? Um, so they can be, there can be a little bit of a double-edged sword there. Because, it, again, it's impossible to put enough energy into something that something's perfectly uh, pure or clear. You can get, you can get pretty close, but, but not, not perfect. Okay. Um, concentration of ref refractory organics, but the expensive operating cost and incomplete treatment effects restrict their widespread application. So again, there's your, there's your money getting in the way. Recently, the incineration disposal in wastewater is getting an increased attention. So it might sound kind of weird, but let's just set, set the water on fire. So you know, send that wastewater into a thermal stream. Into a thermal st uh, stream. Well, you might say, well, gosh, if, if you do it right, then you're just talking distillation. And if you do it properly, then the water could actually come back cleaner than it went in. In fact, uh, just on Monday, I had a really long meeting with a fantastic gentleman. I might have, I might have um, mentioned it. Who's running a, uh, a zero waste biomaterials reclamation plant in Vancouver, and he is able to make extraordinarily pure water with his uh, process. And there's another. Um, uh, another researcher using an actual uh, plasma fusion reactor doing the same thing. So energy goes in and pure water could come out. So that's really what we're after here is, is, is pure waste stream. So uh, it can completely break down the toxic chemicals, greatly reducing volume, and effectively realize waste to energy. And I, I think that this waste energy thing is going to go gangbusters. The question is, and I've, and I've had this conversation with a lot of folks, and I'll tell you exactly who it is, because I have a lot of respect for this uh, scientist, is, um, let's see if I can find him here. They're chasing. He's even got his own Wikipedia page now. Anyway, um, Eric Chasen, he's a, he actually is a, nuclear physicist. He was at uh, Tufts when I met him. Looks like he's now uh, has a position at Harvard. Wrote a book called Cosmic Evolution. And he and I were having waste energy conversations um, years ago. And his, his, and this is just like walking down the, the, the sidewalk in Cambridge. He says, well, what are we going to do with all the heat? And that's, that's still going right back to our paper. This is, this is kind of the new uh, pink elephant or 500 ground pound gorilla or what, or what have you. What, what do you do with all the heat? And as we, as we know, that is the, so heat is the fate of any energy conversion process. It kind of gets back to that, the wacky physics, you know, Russian physics video or entropy and heat. So uh, this, Waste energy, incineration, it's, it's going to be kind of the new, I don't know, 
issue that we deal with um, once we get the CO2 thing figured out. And, it's, and, and they're, they're definitely related. The heat essentially is good if we can put it to use. Yep. Yeah, and, and this is another thing I, I mentioned yesterday. Um, heat would be great in my house right now. Uh, <laughs> and I know there's a lot of hot water flowing downhill from my, you know, from my neighbor's dishwashers and showers and, uh, and, and all that. So, yeah, I, I think um, underground storage of heat would be, a, would be a great place to put it, absolutely. Yeah, so having a seasonal thermal Reservoirs, and in fact, in the, in the talk that I gave yesterday, that was one of my plans. Was under the shed in my backyard. Sean Warner, thanks for cleaning it out. Now I can actually uh, lift the two sides of my shed, get down underground, and yeah, I would love to have a big uh, thermal reservoir that just gets as hot as I can get it all year long, sitting uh, sitting underneath my house, melt my snow, uh, run my hot tub, preheat the water coming into my shower, so. Uh, and, and I think as we'll see here, all these things will become integrated eventually. Okay. Let's take a quick break. I, I do want to look at this paper some more because I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, well, actually, no, let's just power through. We've got eight minutes left. Got kind of a late start today. Let's look at some of the figures because really what these guys are doing, they're, they're, they're engineering the system. They're trying to figure out what is the optimal ratio of these two products, the, the wastewater from the, from the chemicals, and the coal, which we're, China's not short on coal, we're shipping it over there as quick as we can. Uh, let's just see what their figures look like. Okay, so we've, we've covered this already. Um, and, and Shelley, you were mentioning previously, sometimes in, you get into Brian Kern's courses and you haven't seen enough chemistry. Um, we, we do um, ultimate mass analysis in NRGY 101. So here's another example of looking at some chemistry prior to getting in, into Kern's classes. So this is, this is pretty across the board. A lot of different uh, elements coming out of this. A lot of heavy metals. Uh, we've talked about already in, in recycling technology why you don't want aluminum in your central nervous system. Uh, chromium is the same way. Potassium, not so bad. Uh, titanium is inert. Magnesium is, is actually an essential element. Uh, nickel, I do not know of any um, uh, enzymes in the, in the human body that require nickel, but it, it could be the case. And then some organic compounds, so um, Na2O, SiO2, SO3. Uh, this is what's coming out. This is, and, and if you look, uh, this is the vast, uh, the, the vast majority, uh, sodium oxide, and very little um, others below the limit of detection. Uh, so they're, they're, uh, it seems like a, a fairly sophisticated process they have going on. Here's their X-ray diffraction. Here's their scanning electron microscope. Kind of cool, looking at garbage under the microscope, but there it is. <laughs> um, if, if you haven't seen this Arrhenius law before, and I'm not, I'm not sure why you, you, you might have had the opportunity to, Arrhenius was a physicist, I don't remember the, the exact dates, but basically who realized that all chemical reactions sort of have an have an optimal temperature. And you, you experience that every day because your own body has its own body temperature. You get too cold, things start to shut down. You get too hot, things start to, start to shut down. So the um, Arrhenius law basically, basically looks at the optimal uh, reaction temperature for any process. And, and this is going to be the, and so obviously that's what, exactly what these researchers are dealing with. How do I optimize the temperature? They've got their phase one, which is 120. They got their phase twos and threes that are 120 to 700. Then they got their 700, which is, is too hot. We're doing a very similar process right now. Uh, Shauna Munns just received a NASA uh, scholarship to build a rocket stove 
kind of cool that NASA's working on rocket stoves now, right here on Earth. But we're going to deal with the same exact issues with that rocket stove where you get too hot and you start to make knocks. You get too cold and you start to make soot. So somewhere in between those, those two is going to be just right. And the, the Arrhenius equation um, governs that. Um, this is just a mass balance, so they're just looking at masses uh, coming in versus masses going out. They've done a really nice job, and if you do put equations in your paper, this is exactly how to do it. So a sample conversion degree, alpha, and it's just a ratio. It's like an efficiency, right? If you remember, if you remember eta from NRGY 101 and 102, it's the ratio of two masses. So uh, m naught is the initial weight of the sample at the beginning of the combustion. That's what's going in. Mt is the weight of this uh, sample at time t during the combustion process. So it's decreasing. You know, as, as combustion increases, you're, you're losing mass uh, at time t. Mf is the final weight of the sample at the end of combustion. So now they go through some math, but I'm not expecting you to. Um, so I, I've explained in, in words what the Arrhenius equation is, and I've, I've explained what this conversion degree is. And so these are their, um, their inputs. Let's just see what the outputs are. So here's, so now they've defined it for us. Here's your phase one, here's your phase two, uh, here's your phase three, and here's your phase four. And so what they're, um, what they're seeing at different temperatures are these different mass fractions uh, coming off. So they're, they're really, I mean, th this is, in, in my opinion, this is like the, the ultimate in zero waste. I mean, they are doing zero, they are doing waste to energy, they are grabbing all of these elements, um, so really getting the, the best out of it. They're, they're, they're purifying these elements. Now the titanium, the magnesium, the nickel, et cetera, can go back into the, into the stream. It's, it's really showing a lot of ways not unlike what we did with the gold. Um, you know, you, you cook it, all the other stuff goes away, the gold drops out, but in this case, you're really grabbing all, every, everything. And I, I think in a lot of ways this brings us right back to the, you know, very first lecture of NRGY 270 when we talked about just conservation of mass. It's got to go somewhere. Okay, so hopefully what I've done for you here is just showing you how to dissect the paper. Don't get, don't get lost in the weeds and try to teach yourself differential equations uh, <laughs> in, in the next week or so. But do go in and, um, you know, look at how the authors have, have presented things like this in your own field. Um, use, the, use the language that we've been developing in the course so far uh, to write your paper, and um, looking forward to see what you come up with. So next week, we will go into the, thermal, the solar thermal forge, and that's making things hot without setting them on fire. And, and we, we've already talked a little bit about the the um, experiments happening in Hawaii, looking at the depletion of <coughs> oxygen content in the atmosphere, and that's, and in my mind, that's that's really what um, we need to start reversing: is um, pumping more, you know, allowing nature to pump more oxygen back into the atmosphere, and uh, get away from some of these combustion processes. Obviously, that's what these guys are using. I've been developing with some colleagues uh, CCUS or carbon capture utilization sequestration. So keeping the stuff out of there, and hopefully we'll be able to share what we're doing with uh, folks just like this. So, yeah. Question. Okay. Well, thanks a lot for your attention. I'll see you on Tuesday. I, that was that was a great great little read there. I, uh, a couple of years ago, I researched.